wave, so that would be perfect. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. All right. Hello, everyone. My name's Ian. I'm from the University of Lisbon, and I was a visiting student here with Dr. Botterad. And basically, I'm interested in how we treat uncertainty in the models we use for decision making. And today, we're specifically going to look at the case of trying to support renewables and how that treatment affects our results. So I think it's uncontroversial to say that in the long term, when we're making investment decisions, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen. But I think it's useful to kind of see the scope of that uncertainty. So this is projections from the 70s of what uh, primary energy demand would be in the US. And what you can see is that there's a huge range of what people thought would happen. And what actually happened in the year 2000, we're kind of on the extreme low range of uh, those projections, luckily. But imagine if you made an investment decision expecting energy demand to be twice what it is, you know, you're going to kind of be in trouble. Uh, this next one is actually my favorite. So in blue down the bottom, we have forecasts for the levelized costs of a CCGT from before the year 2005. And in red, we have forecasts after the year 2005. And it's not just that after 2005, the sort of average is three to four times higher. It's that before 2005, you know, we had no idea about this uncertainty that exists in this. We were you know, you basically had a consensus about what this was going to cost. So these are kind of very material uh, uh, inputs for investors, and they have to take this into account in their decisions. So next question is, like, how do we deal with this in our modeling? So if we look at the literature, in a recent review of generation expansion planning studies, only 20% contain some sort of stochastic element, and only you know, the vast majority of that 13%, looking at one stochastic element. So they're saying, okay, we're going to look at one uh, thing stochastically, but, you know, uncertainty is kind of across all the inputs. And there's kind of a little bit of a bias towards what you might call a technical uncertainty. Lots of this is people modeling, like, stochastic outages, which is like, okay, maybe plants are not reliable, but if demand is double what you expect or half what you expect, that's much more material for your decisions. So these... Uh, and finally, there's how we actually model this uncertainty inside the model. And this is kind of what we're going to be interested in this talk. And you can see this is in uh, storage expansion planning studies. After the year 2000, there's a huge increase in putting uncertainty into the model. Uh, but the majority of that is people are looking at scenarios or some sort of Monte Carlo analysis, kind of like lots of scenarios, as opposed to uh, full stochastic optimization. So. That's basically the motivation, lots of uncertainty, not so much kind of neglected sometimes in the modeling. And we're going to look at the specific case of a policymaker that's evaluating different policies and how does this neglecting uncertainty affect our results. So specifically, we're looking at how do the different representations of uncertainty affect the results and including this wide range of types of uncertainty. So we're going to basically look at the modeling under three assumptions of uncertainty, and the interpretation of these is the key to this paper. So deterministic, it's pretty uh, makes sense. We have a single view of the future. Scenario analysis, you're probably familiar with this. But the important thing to know is that in each of these scenarios, we're changing you know, our inputs. But effectively, the, the investors have perfect foresight. They know what the future is going to be. Then we, ha we have the stochastic optimization model. We're saying that. You know, the future is uncertain, but you have to make one set of decisions that investors have to take that into account in their decision making. Okay. So it's basically a two-stage uh, generation expansion planning model. And because we're going to have a lot of uncertainty, we're looking at quite a small case study, but hopefully it's representative. It's sort of a small microgrid that's looking at making expansion decisions relating to conventional, renewable, and storage technologies. So what we need is some way to uh, generate uncertainty around our parameters that we put into the model. So what we typically do is called scenario generation and reduction. So on the left, we have sort of historical demand. Uh, 
And what we do, we fit a statistical process, in this case, geometric Brownian motion. And then we generate a whole bunch of future potential scenarios. And you can kind of see the distribution of that in purple. Then, unfortunately, we can't put all of that into the model, so we want to pick a representative set of scenarios, and that's the reduction part, and you can see those uh, four scenarios, and each one of those has a probability associated with it. So you can see the low one is actually much more probable than that high extreme one. Uh, we also do the same for fuel prices, uh, where we fit a stationary process, and we again generate four scenarios. So for renewable technology costs, which is also something that's you know, pretty uncertain at this point, what we do is we take uh, some forecasts of prices and we try each one in the model. And we kind of, this is an assumption, we give each one of them equal weight, but this is something you would scenario, uh, sort of sensitivity test. So in total, we end up with 48 combinations, four demand, four uh, fuel, and these three uh, cost scenarios. So this is the model results without looking at any energy policy. It's basically running three representative five-year steps. And if we look in the, the first set of results in 2023, what we see is that uh, under the deterministic assumptions, the model is actually building a little bit of storage and a little uh, bit of wind generation. So. If I was a policymaker interested in supporting renewables, I might actually relax because I'd say, well, you know, in the short term, we don't need any more conventional technology. Uh, the scenario analysis, we see that on average, some scenarios, maybe there's some diesel technology, but it's very unlikely if I'm just looking at that point of view. But when we take the stochastic optimization into account, saying we have to make one set of decisions that is okay for all the possible futures, we do actually get a conventional technology. So there is something for us to be looking at as a policymaker. Okay, so this is basically a forecast of the emission intensity of our system through time in the deterministic model, and we're looking to basically achieve this limit, just sort of nudge it down to 250 grams a kilowatt hour. And what we're gonna look at is six different policies. So we're gonna look at a carbon limit, it's just like a carbon trading scheme, a carbon price, a renewable investment grant. So that's when we're, it's like a renewable tax credit. We're providing money on the investment, a subsidy, a production subsidy. So when we're paying for the actual generation with our subsidies, and then we're going to look at those uh, if we just focus on one uh, renewable technology, solar. All right. So first, in the deterministic model, this is the changes and what we expect investors to build given we apply our different policies. The first thing to note in the deterministic model in the short term, we don't expect with the carbon limit or the carbon price any change. So just to point out our policies, we're targeting the sort of medium term and we're looking at what's the change that's going to happen now. Uh, the renewable subsidy, the renewable grant, they look exactly the same and the solar subsidy and the solar grant, pretty similar, and what we're doing is we're just displacing some of the wind that would otherwise be built with more solar. So that's if we look deterministically. If we look across all the scenarios individually and then take an average, again, the carbon limit, very few scenarios do we get any change, so on average, it looks like nothing. With the carbon price, we get probably some wind and some different changes in the different scenarios. On average, it's kind of it's difficult to say what would happen, but we start to see a difference between the renewable subsidy and the renewable grant, where the subsidy is a little bit more favoring wind and storage, and the grant is favoring solar. Uh, so again, in all of these models, in this situation, the investors basically know what's gonna happen in the future, so they know the the, what these levels of high or low demand are gonna be, but what happens if we assume that they don't and they have to make investment decisions over that uncertainty? And what we see is that that carbon limit and carbon price do actually change the amount of renewables built. So specifically, we get solar technology. So basically the benefit in the scenarios where that's beneficial outweighs the costs in, in the scenarios where it's not. 
what we see in general is we see more storage technology because if we do build this renewables, we're going to be having it in some scenarios where there's not so much demand and we need to kind of be able to uh, do something with it. The solar subsidy and solar grant, we start to see actually quite a difference in that uh, the solar subsidy has storage and the solar grant, because kind of the, the benefit is, happens as soon as you invest, you get less of a, you get the conventional technology and the, under the solar subsidy, to get the benefit, the model has to produce from the solar in all situations, so it builds storage to do so. The solar grant, it doesn't need to do that. It just builds that conventional technology in case there's a future where there's a lot of demand. So what we were trying to do is hit a uh, carbon intensity limit. Deterministic scenario, we sort of designed all these scenarios so they hit our limit nicely. If we expand those results to see uh, the scenario at a time, the scenario average, what we see is that, of course, there's a much greater range in what the uh, emissions will be. And we see that the only one that actually always hits the limit is the when we put a limit on those emissions. And that's a kind of common result. If you have a, a carbon cap, you have certainty about the amount of emissions that you hit your cap. What you have very a big uncertainty is what the price of those carbon emissions will be. You have a carbon price, you have certainty about the price, but you have uncertainty about how much the emissions will actually be. Uh, and what we see is that on average, which is the red lines, what we expect, we're not actually very often hitting that limit when we take uncertainty into account. And finally, with the stochastic optimization, we're saying un investors have to take uncertainty into account. What actually happens is we have less uncertainty and we have lower carbon emissions overall. And what that means is, remember, remember we saw the investors were building solar and that solar exists over all the scenarios. Whereas when it's optimizing one scenario at a time, in this, there's some extreme scenarios where it decides not to build any renewables. But that doesn't happen because we have to make one set of decisions that apply across all the scenarios. So finally, what's important, well, what is often important is the carbon abatement costs, so how much these different scenarios costs. And again, this differs by our uh, treatment of uncertainty. The solar sub, focusing on solar is obviously the most expensive rather than being more flexible. But if we just sort of take that out of the way, the thing to note, if we look deterministically, the carbon limit looks by far the cheapest policy to achieve our targets. But as soon as we take uncertainty into account, it's actually one of the most expensive because it's the most restrictive. It's saying that we have to meet these targets over all futures. Uh, and again, under the sort of deterministic, th these policies are reasonably similar, but we see once we take the uncertainty into account, this renewable grant is much more costly because again, it, it, it applies differently over uncertainty. The amount you're paying in the renewable subsidy depends upon how much of the generation actually gets used. The renewable grant, you're kind of giving the tax credit as soon as something is built. So the conclusion for policymakers, you know, if we simplify our treatment of uncertainty in these models, it really changes our conclusions and we kind of miss how the market is actually going to react to these different uh, policies. All right. Hello, do we have questions for a speaker, name and uh, state name, and then question, please. Name Hi, I'm Lane from IIT. So can I ask a question? Can you clarify the uh, stochastic um, components that you, that you mentioned in, in, in the model? And so uh, what we consider stochastic, so we have uh, four, four demand uh, scenarios, each with the probability that we've generated, four fuel scenarios, each with the probability, the three uh, costs scenarios each with probability, and then what we have is the it's a two-stage stochastic optimization. So mm -hmm. it's just the first set of build decisions that are made uh, over that uncertainty. I see. So when when you assume a, a Brownian motion for the demand, do you in incorporate all the stochastic comp components into into the process, or, or you you just assume one uncertainty component? 
Yeah, so you, you just fit, so you, you fit the geometric Brownian motion based on the historical data, right? But then you randomly, you know, draw from your normal distribution and get 10,000 potential future scenarios. Mm -hmm. Like, and you can see you get some that are very extreme, but not so many. And that's your kind of, uh, that's your discrete approximation of the continuous distribution of uh, those results. Then you take this sort of representative set, which again is your discrete approximation of the op uh, optimization. Yeah, uh, Mentor from Alidon State University. Uh, I noticed you have two cases. One is carbon limited, the other is carbon price. Right. I was wondering, because when you say carbon limit, if somebody violates that limit, you're fine. So it turns into a carbon price situation, right? So well, what's the difference between two? You just have a harder limit, you cannot. So, so you could, I, I technically don't have a hard limit, but if you had a hard limit, it would be exactly the same. But uh, it's not violated, this limit. Okay. So uh, the carbon price, of course, just goes into the objective function. There's a price every time you emit. This carbon limit just says you can't emit more than this level. Okay. So what you see is we get this big difference in results in that the carbon limit always hits that limit, whereas the price, the effect of putting a price on carbon differs uh, according to the future scenarios. Great question, though, because policies are influenced that if you go over, then that's a carbon price. Is yeah. there another question? Follow up? Over here. Hi, I'm Alexis from the University of Hong Kong. Um, I was just wondering if uh, you've considered policy uncertainty or if you have any um, comments regarding policy uncertainty. So, for example, uh, in, in the Australian case, we implemented a carbon tax, but then it was repealed later on. So uh, how does this kind of factor into uh, this type of analysis? So it's also a very good problem, policy uncertainty, and it's you kind of end up, you're usually looking at the reverse, where you're looking at what are investor decisions looking like given there's uncertainty over the different types of policies. The problem in that situation is kind of it's always such a huge assumption of what's my probability that the carbon price is actually going to happen, like how do I determine that, right? Um, but yeah, you can definitely generate uh, uh, results where you say investment decisions differ depending upon the probability that investors think that different policies will happen. Looks like a role for multi-stage co-optimization, but also maybe Markov models. Question here? Yes, thank you. Nelson Kalili, IIT. Thank you very much for your interesting work. Um, policies usually implemented within dimensions of where you are, economic development, countries, culture, industrial, and government relationship, etc. Uh, we have seen <laughs> those differences between how policies work in United States or North America or Europe versus Asia or developing countries. So how your result relates to those differences? Well, I guess the what we're looking at is that those differences exist, and we're looking at you know when people are making the decisions about how to change them and what direction they should go in, like uh, the assessment of those differences, because we don't have any existing policy in this uh, uh, this model. And of course, there's a number of other factors you usually take into account when you're making decisions on policy. This is just about getting the kind of impact numbers correct. Right. I think we have time for one other question. Um, this has been a really great talk about uncertainty and, and uh, renewables. Hi, Robert from Harvard University. Uh, on slide 13, um, can you explain, or maybe, uh, uh, maybe it's not slide 13 then. It was one where you showed the, um, yeah, this one, slide 12. Um, for the carbon limit and carbon price, can you explain why you don't include storage in that? The storage is an entirely an option for the model, right? It's the model is selecting not to, that it doesn't want to build storage in the short term. Okay. In, in the longer term, once we get more renewables, it needs it a lot more. I see. But so, kind of, if we have the solar subsidy, 
for the model to get paid its subsidy mm. and the benefits it right. needs the, the storage. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, fantastic way to end before the break. So let's thank our speaker and speaker for the session. Thanks. Oh, so great.